good evening or good day, everyone, depending upon where you live in the world. I'm happy to present this next panel discussion about racism in sport. It's understood that music makes the world go around, but lately we have said it is actually sports as well, especially around sports diplomacy. But we would be remiss if we did not talk about some of the fouls that are in sports, including racism. From coaching to commentary, grassroots to stadiums, mirrors the inequalities in society that only structural upheavals across its governing bodies will achieve any lasting change. I remember as a young woman watching the French ice skater, Saria Monolay being demonized for her body type as she gracefully skated across the glowing, at the glistening uh, platform into which she showed her wonderful talent. I remember Serena and Venus Williams also because of their body types, their pigmentation were vilified in the tennis world. And Gabby Douglas, the great gymnast, was also tortured because people commentated on her hair. And let's not forget in football, the soccer arena, where Antonio Grandiger, the Chelsea defender, was seen complaining to the refugee by gesturing his hands under his arms because he heard racist comments which referred to him as a monkey. And even in America with Black Lives Matter, our people took to the streets and took to the NFL league to make sure that they understood the racism that existed within that platform, starting with the demonizing and the pushing back of Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick who wanted to make the gesture of kneeling on the knee to recognize what was happening in America. But here we are today on a brighter scale, talking to individuals who can clarify some of these myths or truths about racism in America. Joining me today is uh, will be Colette V. Smith, the founder and CEO of Believe in You, Inc., the first African-American football coach in the NFL for the New York Jets. Welcome to the platform, Colette. Also join, joining us will be Michael Owen Johnson, former football player, the England uh, teams, and also the England U221s coach. And from Madrid, Spain, the young athletes, Hasma Sissi and Lola Ryan will be talking to us as young sports activists from Dragons du Lava Peas. So I want to start this off by focusing on um, my questions to our young people. Lola, what do you think about racism in football? You're so young, you're 11 years old and Hasma is 12 years old, but I see that you have on the Black Lives Matter uh, sweatshirts. Why are you wearing those and how are you experience at such a young age in Madrid, if you do, racism uh, or how you think about racism in sports as a young person? Hmm. Well, we're in a special neighborhood that in Madrid that in, it, it's special because uh, all people of all around the world live here. And Dragons is a football club. And uh, where uh, the people in my, um, the players in my mixed gender team are Martin, Mario, Berta, Hugo, who are from Spain. Um, Ayu, Mary, Marwan, um, who are from Morocco. Um, Alushan, who is from Sierra Leone. Uh, Salyu from Senegal. Hao from China. And Javier from Ecuador. And um, um, I, I, my parents are from Spain. I'm, uh, my dad is from Spain and my mom is Irish and that's why I speak English and that's why I'm representing my team. And well, um, when my, in my team, they speak uh, Wolof, Creole, Chinese, and, uh, but we all speak football. <laughs> and uh, well, um, I'm gonna speak about um, a few things that happened to a mate of mine called Alusine. 
um, that from time to time in a match he gets insulted and then he may lose his temper and may get a yellow card for his actions and well the referees normally don't hear the insults so we uh, thought of sitting down and stop playing because oh well because it's not fair and racism is very ugly and um and then um um well well we thought of sitting down and stop playing because, but we were never able to do so because football is just too fast and but what we've been able to do is to do a kind of a project called black lives matter in sport and well we've um talk about well foot like the boxer muhammad ali footballers drogba um sadio mané and also the gymnast simone biles and uh well we also talk about our trainer in our team uh, in our club called babu who is from senegal and well he the he li- in his village when he was a boy he wasn't able to play football because his parents thought it was against tradition and religion mm-hmm. and and he came and he crossed the, uh, the desert got into a boat that and he knew his life was uh, could, he could have died and uh, he nearly died and the people who do this l- know that they their their life is uh, they're risking their lives and well anyway um he got to madrid lavapiés and when he got here he didn't have legal papers or a work permit and he won earned money as a street seller um and he also played football on a humble concrete pitch well and his life was like that for 10 years we went uh, earning money as a street seller seller and uh playing football um but then the dragons was creative a uh, created and um a uh, well, uh babu was very good organizing the um, players on the pitch and he was also very good including everybody girls boys from every culture and dragons asked him to be a coach and he accepted and uh one day in a match um th- there was a 9 year old kid that was getting verbally abused by the other t- uh, adults on the other team and babu tried to protect the kid but um he got insulted too and then um he and then um uh, the of uh, the other adults put their keys on their on their fist uh threatening to punch him and uh, the, uh we dragons had to call the police and promise to go against racism forever and and one year later uh he got his uh, his work uh, he's got his legal papers and he was able to go back to his village um and he created a school and a football club called um dragons of karu babuniti and there are sister <laughs> there are sister club and we're very uh, we're very proud of it um and and uh and a few friends of babu uh 10 friends of babu pay 10 euros a month to to support a teacher in senegal i have to tell you lola uh, you've made me so proud about the future of the world you and al uh, hasma and what you're doing your knowledge and your experience is so telling and heartwarming but it's also mind wrenching that you can be so articulate and we have adults who put you in this situation who could not express as well as you have 
the situation in Madrid, which mirrors every place in the world. So I, I applaud you and I applaud your coaches and your mentors for you to know this story because I know that you would be an individual via sport who will become a sports diplomat with that mindset, which cannot be erased as best uh, to my knowledge based upon what you have shared today. But Hasma, given what- Thank you. Well, pardon? Thank you, thank you. You are oh, you're welcome. Gracias, Sinara. Um, Hasma, what do you know about racism and football? What are you, are you uh, biracial? Are you uh, Spanish? Tell us a little bit about you and what you feel about racism in soccer or football. We can't hear you. Speak louder, sweetie. Excuse me. Um, her microphone. Can someone help her with her microphone? Or Lola, can he, you give her your piece? What? Okay, that's better. Uh, all right now. Uh, no. That's better. Um, I know uh, how to introduce racism because my father is from California and my mother is from Spain. I am 12 years old and I love to play football, volleyball, and go cycling. I also love learning Chinese. This is my third year of high school and I'm so happy because for a change, no one is bullying me. And I feel that I am not judged on my appearance. I know it's so weird, but it's true. But this is not like the many times of black people. Moham, a matron de Ghanas, was 10 years old when he was coming back from a football training session. He was stopped by the police. He was wearing the Ghanas football kit. The policeman asked him if he was carrying a knife. I repeat, he was 10. Moha asked the police that he was coming back from training. Of course, he didn't have a knife. When asked the policeman say, you play football, I bet that you lie about your age so you can win. So Moha was very surprised and said to her, someone who is the distributed people say that. How could a policeman be so cruel? Racism does that to people. This is something that Dragon players are highly accused. Other teams complaining about being too tall for our age. Of course, I am tall. I am tall. Why do I need to justify that? Okay, thank you for sharing that story. An another sad uh, encounter to be experienced by, by young girls. But do you think, do both of you, Lola and Hasma, do you both believe that sports or football particularly uh, can help in racism? I love the story that Lola, you start off with telling us that the diverse ethnic groups within your, uh, your club, which is amazing. You have basically the world literally at your feet. And how do you think that you as young people playing this elite sports can grow into helping uh, within your game and within your youth, racism. So do, in other words, are you also doing, okay, how smart community outreaches as a club as well? Uh, and we don't have to talk a lot about this. Uh, we don't have to answer yet, but as you know, it's uh, so we must go working together with other people and other organizations. Uh, I remember going to demonstration against racing science. I was a little girl and I'm happy because that now my friends and my people could something to me. I feel good when I- We're, Hold on, hold on, we're losing you. I, I'm gonna have to ask you to be very still. And if you have another microphone in your yeah. hand, pass it to Lola, because we're getting it uh, a little echo. So yeah. be very still. No, él dice que no lo muevas mucho. Uh, okay. um, 
Uh, I feel good when I see wearing the Black Lives Matter hoodies or when we participate in football against recent uh, action weeks. Uh, but this is not enough and that we must keep fighting because racism cuts too deep and hard too much. It's really difficult to explain, but what I do know, we, I must be a strong and proud of my identity. Twice as a strong, twice as proud to be a girl. Uh, as a strong, this big girl in the graffiti on this wall. As a strong, Wilma Rudolph, the fastest woman of her time. As a strong, the gymnast Simone Biles, who publicly denounced sexual abuse in the USA national team. These are incredible examples, and what and what they have done is incredible, brave, and difficult. And we try to follow their example. So this is where we play football. Uh, after um, it uses to be a building, and after it demolishes. Um, get from the Ghana's uh, training I'm playing here. Um, after a press campaign, we got support to ball these bits. Now women and girls have a place that is safe. Before this play was created, now many women played here and in public space in Laba Pies. Male dominated, dominated public space and girls just look it on. Fans and sing it now. Women and girls reclaimed our space and we did it playing football. That's wonderful. I have one last question for you brilliant young ladies. Why is the Agenda 2030 important for your club? Can you explain to us what that 2030 agenda is? Briefly, thank you. Because um, we're all global citizens and we come from many countries, but we all share one planet. And if the planet is in trouble, we're all in trouble. And uh, at Dragons, I've learned what it is to work hard to get a, to, um, get a goal. And, um, and now we, ha we have to get 17 goals together. Thank you so very much. Uh, Okay. We, have been, we have been created the 17 goals tournament to focus more on this. We played in Madrid and some friends playing in Senegal and Sierra Leone. Our tournament uses football free rules to act reflection and challenge relative with the global goals. And in this time of pandemia, we all have to be together to fight disease, poverty, and all kinds of injustice. I want to thank you both, Lola and Hasma, for your uh, being here with us today. And I want to let you know that's right. Give yourself a high five. You are already what we call an MVP. You're very, very, uh, the most very uh, valuable <laughs> and very important person but you're both very champions. And I believe that through your leadership and those people who are coaching you and directing you that 2030 will be a great place in the world because of you and your initiation into sports diplomacy. I wanna applaud you. Thank you so very much for your presentation. You're welcome. Okay, and Thank both you. young ladies, you're welcome, sweetheart. And both of the young ladies talked about that space being safe for women, which then I'm gonna throw the ball over to or kick it to, depending upon your favorite sort of form of football, to Colette V. Smith, president and CEO of Believe in You, Inc. And the first African-American female coach in the National Football League in America on the team for the New York Jets. You can't get any more masculine than that, my lady, right? <laughs> Hello. So Colette, you, I, first I want you to comment. I saw you applauding, looking uh, with a squinched sort of face when these young girls were telling the stories of their multi-ethnic uh, 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 colleagues or teammates and how articulate and brilliant, how focused they are on what they're situated in in the presence Call, recalling what historically some sports figures like Muhammad Ali and then looking across the waters and their scope globally. I mean, you can't get any better than these young women. So, Madam Smith, Coach Smith, 
What do you I, think about them? I um I applaud you two ladies. I applaud you two young ladies, you young girls. I see you as my hero. You are the strength that I didn't have when I was your age. Quite honestly, if I was an eighth of who you are right now at your age, I'd be the president <laughs> of everything. <laughs> So I applaud you. Um, you you breathe new hope and inspiration to me uh, for you to understand and see what's going on right now and to make a positive change, to make a difference in this world. I applaud you and I, I am, I'm so happy you brought tears to my eyes. And, and after I get off the Zoom, I'm gonna do some push-ups and work out today because of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Colette, I know you know about being a woman in the game. And what people don't know, you actually play football. So it's not so much that you're just coaching on the sideline, right? But you were actually physically in the game. And you did not start at a young age like the, uh, Lola and Hasma. And I right. think that, uh, Michael, that might be uh, uh, amazing to you that she actually played Football, before I even get into the question you, can you just briefly tell us about your actual playing football career? Um, so, so I always loved American football. You know, when I talk about American football, I got to show you a helmet, right? I played this kind of football. It was not allowed for girls to play. So girls were not allowed. My brother got to play football and I wasn't allowed to. That never sat right with me. And so at the age of 42 years old, I was at home and I happened to come across by coincidence about a women's professional full tackle football team. And I thought, well, I have to go try out for this team. I owe it to myself to try out. Um, I didn't believe I was going to make the team, but I still owed it to myself as a, as a, as a child, as a young girl at, at Lola and Hassan's age, I wasn't allowed to. So at this time, I went out to tryouts and I had to experience it. When I saw 45 to 50 women playing football and full equipment, I said, Colette, now you're going to make this team. There are no more obstacles in your way besides yourself. Here it is, go run. I like to say game on, game on. And I made the team. So I was a football player at the age of 42 years old. When most men retire, uh, they retire younger than 42. Mm -hmm. But I started at 42. I wasn't the greatest player, but I was a scholar of the game. I absorbed everything that all of my coaches told me. I went above and beyond. I have to be the hero of my own story. This was a vindication for me that it's never too late to start anything to do the right thing by you and for you and for others. So fast forward from me being a professional football player as a woman, for me to be the first black woman, the first African-American woman to have ever coached in the National Football League was a feat that you deserve. You, our youth deserve, the underserved the people that, are dis that, that have been historically discriminated against most of our lives. So it is, it is a platform that I take very seriously and uh, using my voice, showing by example. Not only did you try to keep me from playing a sport that I love, you, you kept me from it, but I, I beat you, my boy, I beat you. you I'm here be. and I'm coaching you. <laughs> you are. So let's tackle this first question. Okay. I'm going to stay on the sideline coach. Cause you seem fierce. I wouldn't, you know, want to get on, you know, sacked by you. Okay. We know this sport is a powerful tool for promoting social cohesion and important rules such as fair play, mutual respect and tolerance. But sometimes it can also be an arena in which racism and racial uh, discrimination can thrive. You share part of your story with us. Can you tell us more about the journey and the hardships that you face and how you see other women in American sports, particularly when you look at the WNBA league, right? The women basketball players, hey, 
disparity, which is form of uh, a bias. I don't call it racism, but it's definitely a bias against women. And uh, I know that I support women hockey players. So can you give us a little bit more about the discrimination across not only race, but maybe even gender, in addition to the National Football League, but the other sports into which women are engaged? Yes. So for me, I, I live by a code, right? So for me personally, my, I, there, there are five C's. The five C's are character, courage, courtesy, consciousness, and charity. Um, being, not being allowed to play a sport based on your gender or based on, on, on the color of your skin, your, your race. When, when, you, when you think about dissecting the children, black children that are not allowed to play football because they don't have the money to buy the equipment, the helmets, the shoulder pads. So you, you can't give a community a sport and say, here, we're giving you a sport that you're allowed to play and you don't give them the funds to be able to, to, to go through it. True. Sports, as Nelson Mandela would say, is the great uniter, right? I had the great honor and courage, the great honor of meeting Nelson Mandela's um, children. And I did an event with them in Jacksonville at the, at the Panther Stadium. Um, when I think about sports, you can obliterate racism because when it comes to sports, the best is going to win. So your best foot, your best effort is you being the greatest. Are you practicing? Are you eating right? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you showing your, your true abilities on the field? So it almost makes racism and discrimination disappear on the field. And I mean the soccer field, the football field. You're out there, you're a number. You're a number and you're showing yourself. So this is the way for us to, to break through any barriers that we face, uh, institutional racism, uh, gender bias. So for me, it has been the greatest thing in the world for self-care, self-improvement, knowing my worth as a player, as a professional athlete. I know the two young ladies mentioned Simone Biles, right? And um, like, she's a hero. She's a, she happens to be a black woman. She's a hero to us and, and my generation and my population and my demographic. So um, the WNBA, is, is, it's a great thing, but they're still not getting paid enough. They're not getting paid like the men. Uh, so there's, there's, there are challenges across the board that we need to correct and fix. And I'd like to use my platforms to bring awareness to all of this. You know, like Colin Kaepernick taking a stance, taking a knee against police brutality. He has every right to do that. And he's using his platform to empower the world, not his neighborhood, the world, the planet. As my two young ladies, my new warrior sisters, because they're family to me, we're gonna change the planet. You know, it's amazing. People will look at America. I know with the Black Lives Matter upheaval this summer, would think that this is just the uh, smoke on the volcano, but really it's been firing up for a very long time, almost to the state of lava. I remember taking my granddaughter and some of her girlfriends during her uh, eighth birthday to see Dominique um, Gabby Douglas. She yes. do a great gymnastic feat. Yes. And I watched them, and these were all young women, uh, young girls that were very diverse in color. But my granddaughter, I noticed, took two of her little black friends, and they sit on the steps because we were in the, uh, the owner suite uh, of the Washington Wizards at the time. And I looked at them, and I heard her say, look, she looks like us. I would have right. never imagined that seeing yourself uh, visibly uh, as young girls on a sports arena that you were impacted by, but they were mesmerized uh, by that. And I also think about uh, the championship of Kobe Bryant. The greatest loss was not only uh, the loss of yeah. his presence and his great beautiful daughter who played basketball, but his intent to break also racism through the Mamacita uh, 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 
basketball foundation that he founded, but he also, because of the love of, of his daughter, wanted to make sure that there was pay equity for women. So right. absolutely. And so I want to go on. There's a pervasive evidence, Colette, that racism and racial discrimination sports go beyond the individual or collective behavior of fans or isolated cases of racist uh, gestures and remarks made, for example, by athletes, coaches, or club managers. Now, I know you're in those inner circles. Do you think that institutional racism is also at work in the field of sport? And how can we enhance sports organization policies and regulations to promote equal opportunities? And before we say that, I'm, my cousin was Emmett Smith. Oh, famous, wow. famous cowboy. Uh, uh, yeah, cowboy. I know Emmett Smith. I know him very well. And, but, and he was very loyal to the owner, Jerry uh, Jones. But as you know, Jerry Jones had some issues. A lot of the owners have been sanctioned. A lot of them had to give up their ownerships of the clubs, at least not have that active activity because mm -hmm. of very blatant racist, not only remarks, but activities and how they treat the players themselves. I work with uh, the various athletic organizations, whether it's the NBA speaking to rookies and interacting with Roger Goodall. And we had to check them on the racism using black men, like for the poster child for domestic violence in America, right? right? So in that club, since you're in that inner circle and you don't have to talk about the Jets because we want you to keep your job, but in that inside circle, what do you think owners and coaches need to do, you know, to take us from the sideline to across a finishing goal against racism? So, so, so personally, a lot of the owners of these NFL, these 32 NFL franchise teams here in America, they do not know the hardships that race plays in your life if you're a black person, right? So I know, I personally know players, obviously, that, that are black men. And by the way, majority of the players in NFL football are black men right? Over 70%, clear over that. They're a star on the field, but when they leave the field, if they go jogging in, in their neighborhood where they live, they're going to be stopped by the police. Mm -hmm. So these, these owners, do, they're, they're not aware. They don't live through what we go through. I would love to see the NFL owners conduct themselves as NBA owners. And I say that because the NBA encourages their players to speak up on social injustices. They, in fact, they promote it. They say, what do you want to do at the next game? So they all may wear a Breonna Taylor t-shirt and they stand behind them. They encourage it. The NFL doesn't do that. This was the first year that I've seen the NFL make any kind of changes to let our, to, look, to allow our players to use their platforms and their voices to promote equality Absolutely. and to bring awareness to police brutality. We need to let our players live, let our players use their voices. You're using the players to win games for you. Let these players use their platforms for social justice. I wanna see more of that. Okay, and the last question to you, because I see that Ms. Domine J has joined us and Michael seemed like he wants to really chime in. So the last question to you briefly, Colette, is during an interview with North Shore, uh, North Jersey, you said that the Me Too movement had given you courage to speak up and through your journey to help others. The Me Too movement, for people who don't know, uh, is a great women's movement against sexual harassment. Uh, in America that has taken flight across the world. So can you talk about that briefly so we can then hear from Dominique Day and Michael Johnson? Of course. So um, I, I personally, and, and I'm very transparent about everything that I deal with in this world and, this, and the way I handle my life. I'm a five-time rape survivor. I am a three-time suicide survivor. And I've dealt with domestic, I've, I've been a victim and a survivor of domestic violence. Today, I'm using my platforms to empower others and the Me Too movement let me know it is okay to speak up about this. Um, when I was working with the New York Jets, I don't work with the Jets anymore because I started my own company, Believe in You Incorporated, 
that empowers black youth and women. Uh, and, and I'm most proud of that. Do I love football? Yes. Do I love coaching? Yes. Was I great at it? Yes. But my purpose is bigger than that. My purpose is to empower. And so I use my voice very openly and very candidly that if there was something that was done wrong to you, speak up about it. I've, football, football saved my life. It threw me a lifeline. And now I want to continue to throw a lifeline to others based on my achievements. I'm in the history books. I'm the first black woman to coach in NFL history. I'm the first woman to coach in Jets franchise history. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I am also a women's pro football player at the age of 42. I'm in the history books. Well, what am I gonna do with that? My job is to empower other people through what I've gone through. And I'm happy to be here with all of you, with Dominique, Michael, Marcia, these two young ladies, I love you guys. So use your voice, stand up for what you believe in and voice it out loud. Thank you, Colette, for telling us that now that you have the love of sports, we know what you're gonna do with it, okay? okay. Thank you so very much. And Dominique, usually, you know, ladies first, but Michael's been hanging on. We know that you had- No, no, it's all good. Okay, so he's gonna be the gentleman. No, Dominique, this is good to follow up. Thank you, Michael, for being the gentleman. You know, the Sabrina of young women and us old sage persons, I should say. But Dominique, thank you so very much for joining us. Dominique is the chair of the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent. Dominique, uh, first tell us a little bit about you and why you believe that sports uh, is a great platform to, for diplomacy, for unity, and ending racism in your parts of the world, at the UN that's everywhere, right? But specifically how we can utilize that platform for the individuals who might be participating and listening to us today. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all so much. It is a real privilege for me to join you here today. I wanna to apologize for my delay. Our public session is also being held this week every morning. And so we've been in session all morning and then I just jumped over here. Um, but it's really my honor to be able to join you because I think um, uh, this, I think sport is actually offering us a real eye into what it looks like to really confront racism, to really dismantle systemic racism and to really demand more in ways that few other areas have, have really met this moment. Um, so I'm, uh, as you know, I'm the chair of the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent. I'm an attorney, I'm a human rights attorney in the US. Um, and what we do is we look and we investigate the situation of people of African descent of black folk around the world and the ways in which they're able to access our human rights, um, including rights to education, rights to life, rights to family, rights to our children, and, and, and how both states and, uh, and private enterprises make that happen. Um, so that's what I do within that role. And in that space, we, go, we do country visits, we participate in important conversations like this, and we try to really shine some light on how, um, how prevalent anti-Black racism is in the spaces that we operate, that we walk through every day. I think just what Colette was saying earlier, the ways in which it shows up in our lives, the ways in which we experience racism that um, folks right next to us may not may not even see, even if it's even if it's happening right here, it may be invisible to the people who are walking with us, who don't have and don't share our lived experience. A lot of our role has been to try to really amplify and uplift how racism operates in our world and how many different ways it operates in our world today. Um, and I think in the, in the world of sport, we're seeing some of the most important and provocative engagements with what it looks like to really confront, to think about, to understand racism. Um, I am not any kind of an athlete. I have a lot of respect for everybody here today. Um, but I will say this, I have been floored by what I've seen um, from athletes this year. I, I, I've, I've seen a lot of, um, statements from, for example, the WNBA, where the women have said, we have been um, uh, criticized and controlled on what we wear and how we look and how we act and our comportment. Are we ladies enough? Do we look too, uh, too muscular? Ultimately, 
whether these whether these criticisms are coming in the language of sexism, of racism, of homophobia, they all are grounded in race. You have a you have a you have a league, and to be honest, a lot of our leagues, as as you said earlier, are largely dominated by people of African descent. And what we see is this intersectional racism that continues to populate. Uh, these mindsets and it's mindsets of people who learned um, and by people I mean our world who learned to think about blackness through the lenses of colonialism through the lenses of uh, the legacies and the lenses and the legacies of uh, the trade and trafficking in enslaved Africans when we learned uh, centuries back right that our bodies are disposable our bodies are available that when you have a game you'd like to play when you have entertainment you'd like to promote when you have a profit you'd like to make here are the bodies that you can deploy in service to that and use as pawns um, that was a lesson that was created way back when when they wanted to make sugar an impossible crop to produce into a commercial product that can be available everywhere right that was a lesson of what it looks like to create a labor force for business opportunity for profit opportunity for white enrichment and the need to create and and to promote white supremacy as a justification for atrocity this wow. is something we still see in the sport world today right this is something we see we see colin kaepernick on a knee being delegitimized and disrespected and not even being able to uh, uh, promote his own career because he's stepping out of the role of the, of the acceptable role of a black body in that space. This is something that we were seeing, right? With NBA and WNBA as people struggle, right? It's, it's, it's not an easy thing. And, and I don't know that we've given these athletes enough respect for what they've done. It's not an easy thing to become an activist after you've spent your life single-mindedly learning a skill and learning a trade. It's not an easy thing to figure out what's the next step? How do we protest? How do we do it effectively? How do we really engage people? And this is something that athletes on the national stage in the United States and elsewhere have really stepped into willingly and boldly this year in ways that I have tremendous respect for in part because um, I think their own understanding of systemic racism is so tied to these legacy mindsets, right? This idea that we will draft, we will pick these people, we'll put together a little team, we'll organize a game and then ask them to play it with no humanity, with no respect Absolutely. for their depth and, for, with, with, and without really understanding that these are people who also feel and see the world uh, deeply. The ways Absolutely. in which they've experienced intersectional racism absolutely influences their understanding of what's happened in this moment and their ability and their willingness to really um, confront this moment with, with language, with activism, with words. And I think we've seen this year uh, more than any other, how effectively athletes and sport can really be at the front lines of a fight against systemic racism. Well, you're absolutely right. My engagement in sports went back to the mid eighties when as a public information officer for the city of Chicago, I was over every, uh, our national sports teams as far as the celebrations, because that year the Chicago Bears won, Michael Jordan was coming to Chicago, so you know the Bulls were winning like crazy. And even the, uh, the Cubs, I think, won the White Sox that particular year. But one thing I did understand in interacting with the players themselves is that normally the Black players, you picked from some small town in the South, you never been around other people outside of your race. Then they, your owners have you to move to the suburbs where you isolate yourself of communities. And we know economically for black players, particularly in America, when they got paid, they saved not only their family, but a whole community because of the poverty most of them found themselves. And because Michael Jordan is a personal friend and I told him this personally, Michael Jordan, a lot of players were made to be apolitical and asocial because their owners didn't want them to reflect upon their economic downturn if they spoke up politically, which I challenged Michael Jordan and who has recently, as you have noticed, also has come out and starting to be more political and an advocate for black communities because I know personally that he has suffered a lot of forms of racism when he could not buy a football league uh, Magic Johnson is a friend of mine. It took a long time for him to be able to be involved in ownership of a major league, which he's now with the uh, Giants, I believe. 
uh, out there in California, but thank you. You gave us such great wealth as to the global perspective of racism in general. And I thank you, Dominique. So now I'm gonna go to the gentleman who has been uh, sort of footballing our conversation with the women. So Michael, you know, I just wanna know overall, what are you feeling as a black man? I know that you've had your own uh, circumstances around racism, but before we go into that, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about what you're hearing from the women today, and then I'll ask you a question. Sir, Michael Johnson. Well, thank you very much for having me. And it's been a pleasure to be on a platform with such powerful ladies. It's really, it's really inspiring and motivating to hear. Um, my journey is I'm born in the UK, born in Nottingham, um, which is about an hour from London. You guys would probably know London very well. Nottingham, Nottingham's less well known. Um, I started playing football in the 1990s, around 91, 92, was my first start into professional career. Um, I had a 20 year career stretching from playing international football for Jamaica, which is my parents' place of birth, but predominantly staying in the UK for my football career. Um, I retired at the age of 37. So Colette, I was inspired by you saying that you started at 42. I'm like, wow, I gave up at 37. That's a superwoman right there. <laughs> so I gave up at 37 and then embarked on a 10 year education around making sure that I was qualified for so many positions. And it's been a challenge acquiring certain roles, even though you have the qualifications necessary to get these positions. The landscape of the industry of football, soccer as you know it, within the UK is very much white. It's white men who probably are 60, 70, probably 70 plus who govern the game. So the major governing bodies are run by white men. We probably, we have less than 2% of ethnicity in senior leadership positions within the game here. Within the 92 football clubs that we have, we have um, out the 92 managers, we only have four, which are people of colour in those out of 92. And when you water that down into players, the players make up 33%. But then the transition from the field into managerial positions, into senior leader positions is, is nowhere. Is, mm -hmm. Yeah. You're right. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. And, I, and I'll just finish with, with that. And, and I think that lends itself now into how the game is governed and how decision-making processes are made and legislations and rules and how it impacts people of colour, how it impacts the grassroots, the young players that are coming in. Because there's nobody in senior leadership positions who takes, um, who takes the real vigour around the black voice within the game, the black experience within the game. So there's so many things that are impacting us as people, but yet we don't have the authority, the legislation to really drive home change. And the kind of questions we're asking now is, does it really matter to the people upstairs? Mm -hmm. Right, you know, it's amazing. When I think about, I spoke of Michael Jordan uh, and my relationship to him, but Michael Jordan uh, also was the person who created economic wealth for Nike, right? Because he recreated the, the style. We talk about not only how black bodies make wealth for the owners through the athleticism of the sport that they choose to play, but also the byproduct of athletic wear, right? Uh, Cause Michael Jordan took it from the little coochie sort of shorts that the men used to wear playing uh, uh, basketball to the more loose sort of hip hop style, which revolutionized and everybody wanted to be like Mike. And now you look at LeBron James and how they revolutionized the sports wear industry as well. We see that with the onset of women in sports with uh, Venus and Serena Williams sports lines, every major sport designing uh, company is also utilizing the mostly black women, yes, other white women in sports, but the black body started to be the mannequins to increase the revenues of owners and the clubs without the benefits of the players themselves because from uh, the fresh wear, the ready wear, the NBA players, whatever that is, that money is part of the coffers to the owners, right? Which might necessarily go to each player depending upon the 
independent uh, deals they make with, with agents. But this question, Michael, to you, is your experience in, uh, with racism in the club culture, do you think that the regulations that are put forth can help prevent racist attacks? I mean, racism is like water. Can you, is there any sort of fence that it can be stopped or dammed that can be built? Uh, to your you, estimation and your experiences. Yeah, if you was to ask me now at, at this particular moment, do we have the necessary um, trust um, legislations and persons in place to really challenge? Absolutely not. Um, we see frequently um, issues happening where there's attacks on young and successful black men about how they spend their money whether that's they're buying a home for their, their families or buying homes for their um, parents. This is demonized over here, as opposed to something that is celebrated by a young black man looking after his family and making sure that his interests long-term are, are, are safe. Um, we have so many issues on social media where a, a black player will miss a penalty and the following morning, the social media, you look on the, the thread and it's pure racism. And these issues are not dealt with in the right and proper way. I'm not sure if anybody's seen the, um, the England game against Bulgaria last, last year, last season. Mm -hmm. The team walked off the pitch um, because Bulgaria was, were, were taunting the players with racist ins insults, making certain salutes that were predated back to, to the World War II. Um, and so, when you see the punishment that was met out to this country was £25,000, um, which is not even a car, uh, the price of a car in the UK, but yet you're punishing the country by £25,000 for racism. And so that I could go on with so many um, problems. So when you ask me about um, is the UK set up to deal with racism and the legislation and the rules absolutely not um, and until we start to get people of color into the higher echelances of the game um i fail to really um i fail to really understand how this is going to be tackled unless those that really feel it will be in those places where they actually can start to influence change and make sure that policies and procedures and legislation and all these things that need to be put in place to really impact those that are um, the ones that are, are using racism words or slogans. Um, it, it needs to happen where people of color are now in senior positions. I think that uh, maybe you can take uh, the, the lead from American athletes. I think they're driving the conversation with the owners and the leaderships because we, there's an adage I take from a movie called A League of Their Own about women baseball players like this, the train moves, not the station. And what I tell athletes, you are the vehicle which drives the wealth, drives the enthusiasm, up uh, peak the spectatorship on your performance, your entertainment, your gladiator sort of skills in this uh, coliseum called sport. So I think that the more the players around the world start talking about it, it will become a truly uh, diplomatic platform to which we think can unify people beyond race, religion, gender, and other social constructs that divide us. Well, we're going right toward the end of this, and I want to give an opportunity for you all to make some closing statements, one minute each, and I'll start with you, uh, Colette. You're on mute, Colette. I'll mute yourself. Okay, so so I want to talk about two things. One of them one would one be minute. one minute. Jesse Owens, 1936 Berlin Olympic Games. Absolutely. The black man who won what 400 gold medals, <laughs> right? And 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 Hitler did not want him to play. Mm -hmm. Okay, not to perform. So we conquered that. It's scary to know that we're back full circle in these days again because of leadership, poor leadership, right? Mm -hmm. So we got to use our voice. Also, I want to talk about women's football, women's pro football, the WFLA. We're actually now 
paying our players to pay. We're, play, we're paying our players now. Women for 20 years were not able to get paid to play Absolutely. based on gender. We're changing the dynamic. The bigger we use our voice, we got to stand up, use our voice and speak up. We can, if we all unisonly do this, the world can be a better place. Okay, thank Amen. you. Amen, game on. Dominique, quickly, sorry. Um, I just want to say, I think, I think sport and athletes can also be an important space to reimagine what's possible and what can happen. Um, I, I really, you know, I hear, we heard, we use these terms like owners and, you know, I went to undergrad at Harvard, we had overseers, but at the same time, mm. while we couldn't, while they, while they were troubled to admit enough black students into the class, they knew they had to admit 80, and this is what we were told at the time, 80 football players in order to have a senior string. And in order to do that, they brought in football players, they gave them school in the summer so that they would be able to meet the academic requirements going forward. This was a type of affirmative action that did not result in a huge amount, right? Like this was something that was offered to athletes as elites because it was in the interests and almost like you were talking about before, it, it, it had to do with the profit and the interest and the wealth and the, and the brand of the school. And so we see that, especially even among black people who would want to fight in the direction, we see different reimaginings of what's possible, of how we can interact are possible when we actually tap into what's being done for people whose lives are actually really important to these sort of white powerful interests. At the same time, I think athletes are shining a very important light on how the availability and disposability of black bodies um, can play out. And so that I think there's, uh, I'm not saying this very well, but I think there's something on each side here where we can really use the experience of, yes. of elite and, and, and uh, these sort of wealth driven spaces in sport to really think about what could happen and what should happen when we're not talking about, we don't have the resources sources, we don't have the political will. And I think at the same time, sport gives us a really good look at a current manifestation of the expendability, disposability, and availability, perceived availability of our bodies and, and how that plays out. All right, thank you so much, Dominique. Uh, I think we have one more minute for you to end this, uh, Michael, for us. Uh, well, I think for me, the, the, the real interesting point is, is how do we collaborate together? I think the, the, the unity is real strength and power. There's some real commonalities with the themes that I've heard today. And also, I'd like to challenge everybody to break down this stigma about leadership amongst our people, that we are um, much more than just athletes. There's some really, right. there's some really smart, intelligent um, char char characteristics that we have that could lend itself to leadership. What, we, what we're always exposed to are he can just run or he can, he can jump. But actually there's so much more that needs to be broken down about the black athlete in terms of leadership. When I look at the, um, the NFL and I don't see enough quarter, quarterbacks in the, scene, in the major positions, why is that? And it's a similar sort of straight trait that happens in England where we were just defenders. We're not the main position. We're not the captains, but there are so many leaders within sport. So I'd encourage us to look at leadership and how that plays out in the senior roles in businesses and organizations. You're absolutely right. And, you know, just recently yeah. uh, within this month, we did get, I think it's eight to 10 new black quarterbacks, which was amazing, but that was driven by the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. I know, I don't believe it, I know it, but I'm Marcia Dyson, one of the members of the high panel for the Save the Dream. Uh, foundation and also the CEO of Women's Global Institute where sports diplomacy is one of our modules of concern. Thank you all very much for joining me today and on this wonderful platform to discuss racism in sports. But what I think that the viewers will know too that it goes outside of the, the field, goes outside of the court or, or uh, the green, so to speak, that it depends upon uh, the citizenry regardless whether you play or not, that we're in the game, all of us should be to end racism in our prospective countries, our communities and around the world. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the floor. Uh, thank you so much to the chair of the panel, Mashia, 
and uh, member of our uh, uh, board of uh, Save the Dream. And thank you so much to the amazing panelists and, and speakers. I, I really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, now, I mean, the, the time has come to, to close the, the first day of uh, Securing Sport. Uh, it has been a, a wonderful day for, uh, for us. I hope it was for you. Uh, wonderful, first of all, because we could uh, reconnect and spend one, uh, one whole day with uh, our best partners, our best allies, our best friends. So that's certainly you know, so, something that makes us is, uh, extremely, extremely happy. Uh, and regardless, let's say, the, the physical uh, distance, uh, rarely, let's say, we felt so, so close to, to people and to our organization, because I think that uh, there is something that is called uh, uh, trust and uh, common vision that is keeping us really uh, close to each other, you know, regarding the, the fact that we are sitting, let's say, in many instances on uh, different countries and even different uh, continents. Um, it has been really a, uh, an inspiring day. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, viruses which are affecting uh, sport and which are affecting society. We spoke about the virus of uh, COVID-19. We spoke about the virus of uh, corruption, the virus of terrorism, the virus of racism. So, even if we are not doctors, but we had to address all these uh, uh, viruses which are affecting our, our world. But at the same time, we also talked about uh, uh, systemic uh, challenges that uh, our society and including the sports sector has to, to deal with, the sports sector, but also government, such as the, the challenges which are brought by rapid advancement of, uh, of technology, migrations, climate change, environmental issues, and so on. Uh, we spoke about policies. We thought about policies that can uh, help us to mitigate uh, risk, that can help us to address uh, challenges in a, in a proactive way. And we spoke also about uh, solutions, very concrete solutions, including ways uh, to attack the, let's say, criminal economies which are trying to undermine the, the world of sport. And finally, we, and I think this, uh, Final last panel is a very uh, clear, let's say, demonstration of this. We spoke about uh, the need to protect uh, opportunities, the need to restore opportunities. Um, and when we talk about opportunities, we obviously talk, talk, and we have to talk about uh, human factors. Um, in this regard, uh, I I would like to uh, to mention uh, before let's say closing uh, this uh, first day of uh, of works uh, an initiative that we have uh, recently launched thanks to the uh, the help and the technical support of the International Labour Office, which is a program on uh, skills development through sport and through sport based uh, initiatives. So this is a, a new program that the ICSS has uh, recently launched with the idea and uh, with the objective to uh, promote the development of skills of youth through sport and through sport-based projects. But most importantly, the initiative aims and will create a system of uh, skills certification. The development of skills and the certification of these skills is essential to promote and to restore opportunities. Because when the skills are certified, skills are recognized. When skills are recognized, they become a value for possible employers. They become a value to create opportunities and in particular to uh, protect, let's say, equal opportunities across, across sector. So I didn't want to miss this opportunity to announce this. And I wish to thank the International Labor Office for their support in developing such an approach. So having said that, I just want to reiterate my gratitude to all the, the moderators, to all the amazing speakers that have uh, inspired us across uh, these hours of work. Uh, be reassured that we will uh, consider all the ideas and all the input that you gave us in the course of the day, and we will utilize it to give a, 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 the best possible course to our work in 2021 and uh, in, the, in the long term as well. 
Uh, allow me also to thank uh, our uh, production company, ICLI, uh, for their amazing support today and for the support that they will give us in the, in the coming days until the completion of uh, securing spot. Um, so I hope we will, uh, we will uh, see all of you uh, tomorrow uh, when we will uh, continue the conference through the organization of the expo debates uh, starting at 3 p.m. door time, which means uh, GMT plus three, uh, in case uh, this is more understandable. So once again, thank you so much and uh, enjoy the continuation of, uh, of the work. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.